So we're here today to talk about this new landscape for trademark protection for brands in the cannabis, CBD, and hemp fields. Trademark protection is valuable for all types of businesses, and we're going to go through briefly why trademark protection is so valuable and important for all businesses. Then we're going to talk about the new strategies that have evolved for cannabis, CBD, and hemp brands when it comes to protecting their trademarks. And then we're going to uh, talk about the particulars of these different strategies and their different applications and benefits. And we'll try to keep this under an hour so that um, we don't hold you for too long. And we'll be making a recording and sending it out and I'll provide more details about that in just a moment. So first a brief moment about myself, Eric Pelton. I'm located in Falls Church, Virginia, right outside of Washington, DC. I was an examiner with the US Patent and Trademark Office when I began my career reviewing and approving and denying and um, dealing with trademark applications. Since 1999, I've been private in private practice on my own. And during that time, I've registered more than 2,500 trademarks for all different types of clients all around the world um, in all different fields and businesses. And in particular, in the last year or so, I've been working with the firm and their clients and have worked with um, about two dozen different clients to apply for and deal with federal trademark applications and consult on other trademark issues and matters. You can see here a few brief disclaimers that are typical for any presentation in this industry. Of course, the webinar does not constitute legal advice and no attorney-client relationship is created by this presentation. Of course, every situation is unique and you should consult an attorney regarding your particular situation. And of course, as everyone knows, marijuana remains a Schedule I controlled substance under federal law and under the Controlled Substances Act. And no advice provided here today is intended to give any guidance or assistance in violating federal law um, or complying with federal law. And compliance with state laws does not necessarily equal compliance with or provide any immunity from or shield from prosecution under federal law. And at any time, these federal and state laws and policies may change regarding the legality or illegality of any products or services in the cannabis industry or regarding the handling of trademarks. And in fact, that is part of the reason we are here today is because the laws related to trademarks have shifted. You're welcome and encouraged to provide questions via the chat function during the presentation. Unfortunately, we won't be able to get to answers of all of the questions today. And we have allowed for the questions to be um, only submitted privately because we wanna make sure that um, any confidentiality or other issues are not exposed to other viewers of the webinar. But we will receive all of the questions and I will try to answer some as we go along or at the end. And we will follow up within the next day or two uh, with a summary of the key takeaways from this presentation, a link to the full recording of the presentation, and an answer to the top and most common questions from the presentation. There's been a myth out there for the last few years that brands in the cannabis industry cannot obtain trademark protection. We're here today in part to talk about why that myth is wrong. You see here some examples of some well-known, some not well-known brands that are in this space. These are all from registered trademarks in the US Patent and Trademark Office. I pulled these from the USPTO records this week. Before we talk about how trademark registration and protection works for brands in these industries, I want to talk about why trademark protection is so valuable for brands in all industries, whether they're restaurants or retail stores or law firms or any type of business. 
uh, trademark registration with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office confers significant benefits and a tremendous value. It allows the user to use the circle R symbol, uh, which helps ward off potential infringers and copycats and demonstrates the significance of the brand to the clients and customers and potential customers. Having a registered trademark allows for the trademark to appear in the USPTO's database, which helps avoid potential conflicts and infringements just by its very nature because of two reasons. One is that when brands, when businesses are developing new brands, they are frequently checking the USPTO records for potential conflicts or their attorneys are checking the USPTO records for potential conflicts. And the appearance of a brand name registered there may help someone make a decision that avoids a conflict from ever arising. And it also is helpful to be in the database because that's what the USPTO examiners search when they're reviewing applications for registrations for potential conflicts. They're searching only the pre-existing USPTO data of registrations and pending applications. So appearing in the database by itself is doing work for the brand to protect it. A registered trademark with the USPTO also creates a tangible asset. That asset can be licensed, it can be transferred, it can be assigned a monetary value, um, it, it can be handled like property in many different ways. And that's why we call it intellectual property because it is related to other types of property. And this is really of a tremendous value in these fields because there are so many deals and licenses and transactions where brands are involved. And having that brand recorded at the USPTO and assigned a number, like you see this registration certificate that I've provided as an example from the USPTO public databases, makes it that much easier and more valuable to transfer it or have other relationships between parties for the trademark. Having a registered trademark also allows the owner to sue in federal district court generally and provides the owner with greater opportunities to seek enhanced damages and attorney's fees. Trademark protection at the USPTO also provides coverage in all 50 states as of the date that the application is filed generally. This is very important in all industries, but particularly in some of these particular industries we're talking about today, where businesses may be located in only a particular geographic area. Without federal trademark protection, the rights may only extend to a limited geographic area in many cases. The common, these are called common law rights. Having a trademark registration with the USPTO helps extend those rights into other states and all US territories. And of course, because so much um, business and information is being transacted online, regardless of one is, where one is located, that's extra valuable in today's uh, internet age. It's also valuable online because having a registered trademark makes it easier to deal with domain name cyber squatters, makes it easier to deal with um, people who create usernames that conflict with the trademarks on social media sites like Facebook and Instagram and Twitter um, and on Amazon and other online platforms. And in general, for any type of dispute, having the trademark registration is going to make it more likely that the dispute is resolved more quickly and less expensively than it would otherwise. A trademark registration also gives the ability for some owners to record their trademark with Customs and Border Patrol to deal with import issues um, that may not be as relevant um, to many of us here, but it may have some application. Overall, a trademark registration enhances the value and protection of your brand and acts as insurance, reducing the risk of getting involved in expensive disputes as either a plaintiff or a defendant. And you see here a sample of, again, another sample of what a U.S. Patent and Trademark Office registration certificate um, looks like.
when the registration process is completed. Traditionally, there have been limitations for brands in the cannabis, CBD, and hemp spaces, limitations for the opportunities for trademark protection. This limitation spent, you know, stems principally from the overlap in federal and state laws and the conflicts in federal and state laws in so many states, and from the fact that the US Patent and Trademark Office will only register marks for goods or services that are lawfully used in commerce. And lawfully used in commerce is under federal law that they're looking at. And you see the citations to the relevant statutes and some cases. Um, there have been multiple cases making it clear that cannabis and marijuana are considered under federal law to violate the CSA and that cannabis and marijuana products or services that directly deal with the plants um, or some smoking apparatus violate the CSA in the USPTO's mind and therefore are ineligible for trademark registration. And there's some more cases here supporting those recent propositions. It's not a recent proposition, it's just recently been applied as people have tried to challenge it in these fields. But the options have evolved and now there are more options today than ever before to obtain trademark registration. So federal registration is now an option for brands that are um, CBD or hemp products or that have CBD or hemp products without THC or cannabis in their portfolio of products or services. For products or services that are still affected by the CSA, there are options for some limited registration at the USPTO. And we're going to talk about that in more detail as well. And finally, there are state options that can supplement or act as at least providing some benefit and some registration when the other options may not exist. This landscape is, is, as you're going to see, shifting quickly and has evolved a lot over the last 24 months, I would say, um, in addition to the laws in many states evolving and the law federally shifting um, in different directions, the way that the trademark uh, office has handled these and the strategies that have evolved has shifted. Each circumstance, of course, is going to be unique because there are a lot of particularities and details here that are significant and matter. And there may be instances where all three of these strategies I've outlined on the left may apply to the same brand or the same business or to different portions of it. And I think you'll see why as we move forward. So the, the big news, the, the increased opportunity that came down just last week from the US Patent and Trademark Office was a new exam guide that followed the 2018 Farm Bill and confirmed that um, goods encompassing cannabis or CBD that are now uh, comply with the 2018 Farm Bill and no longer barred by the CSA. In other words, they're derived from hemp and they have uh, either no or very, very small traces of THC, um, are now eligible for registration. They are eligible for registration after 12 20, 2018, the date of the Farm Bill being enacted. Applications that were filed prior to that date may now be amended to amend both the filing date and amend the description to comply with the requirements to, to meet under the Farm Bill and under the new USPTO's policy. So you see here on this next slide, some of the additional particulars. Um, and one key thing to point out is that the Food and Drug Cosmetic Act, the Federal Food and Drug Cosmetic Act, may still play a role here in affecting some um, CBD products um, and we're waiting for more regulations to be promulgated and to see if there will be changes 
to the FDCA that could then affect how the USPTO is interpreting things. But um, the USPTO may handle products that are ingested or that are fall under the FDCA differently from other CBD products that do not invoke the FDCA. And the FDCA may be an additional hurdle for some of those products. This development from the USPTO not only follows the December enactment of the Farm Bill, but it um, follows a significant growth in brands in this industry um, seeking trademark protection and trademark registration at the federal level. You see here a search that I did recently for files in the USPTO that reference CBD, hemp, cannabis, or marijuana in the description of the products or services. And in 2010, there were just 300 or so such applications. In 2015, there were 900 or so. And then in 2018, that number skyrocketed. And in 2019, it's set to increase um, you know, by another 50% or more. And so now with this USPTO specifically um, outlining the new policy, related to CBD and hemp brands, I expect it to grow even more quickly in the next few months. It's important to know that an application at the USPTO for a brand that is a CBD or hemp brand and may now be clearly eligible for registration for those products at the USPTO under this new policy, such an application must still, of course, meet all the other requirements of a trademark application for any type of brand at the Patent and Trademark Office. So the Trademark Office is going to review it and make sure that there's not a likelihood of confusion with a previously registered mark. There's going to be limitations if the mark is descriptive or words in the mark are descriptive. There's a, a bar on registering marks that are made up of only generic words in the industry. Uh, there was a recent case where a animated TV show that related to cannabis called Cannabis Cannibals was refused as descriptive. This case really is not significant other than that it's a reminder that all of these traditional requirements for brands, whether they're restaurants or auto manufacturers or computer software companies, apply to brands in these fields as well. The applications must feature a proper description of goods and services. The applications must feature proper evidence of use eventually. Although it is significant to point out here that an application can be filed based on um, solely an intent, a bona fide intent to use a mark in commerce. So you don't actually have to be making sales yet commercially. You can be underway and in the process and have an intention to use a brand name or a logo or a slogan in commerce commercially and file an application based on that. Um, and that is a really useful tool because the earlier you apply, the earlier you start getting protection, the earlier you appear in those that USPTO database. And the earlier your, mark, your application is going to be considered and evaluated in the context of other pending applications. So particularly because we're seeing a essentially a land rush of applications in this space and expect that to multiply even quicker with the new policy announcement last week, filing an application based on intent to use is valuable and important rather than waiting another few months until there actually is commerce. So that's one thing to consider and to evaluate. Now, what about the situation where the applicant has some products or services that involve the CSA and some that don't. Um, I'm, I'll talk more about an example here, but in general, I would register 
as soon as possible for those products that don't involve the CSA and prepare for what might happen for those that do in the future and examine state registrations for the products that do um, involve the CSA. So if there was, um, if there's an edible company or a chocolate company that has both products that are CBD from hemp based with no THC and has cannabis based products that do have THC, they could register now and limit the description of the products to those that feature only CBD from hemp and therefore comply with the policy. So they would be able to get a registration for the brand name to use the circle R to appear in the USPTO's database. They wouldn't be able to cover all of the products, but covering what they can is better than covering nothing, better than not having an overall registration at all. Um, I'm just looking at, there's a lot of questions coming in, so it's going to be really hard um, to try to respond to them. And I see um, we're, we're pointing that out, but we will be making a full copy if you've missed anything or if you joined late. Um, we will be circulating a full copy of a link to download the entire presentation. We will also review the most common questions and provide some of the responses to that um, in the email that provides the link that we're going to we will do our best to get to you in the next 48 hours. So an example of registering for products that don't involve the CSA is Chong's Choice, which you see here is registered for apparel and for other smoking paraphernalia that could be used with tobacco or other products. Um, and in fact, you see at the bottom, they had to specifically tell the USPTO that they were limiting these products to um, not containing cannabis or for the use with cannabis. Um, of course, people who buy the products can use them for whatever they want, complying with the law wherever they are, um, but the scope of the registration is limited to these things. The benefit is they still got a registration, again, that allows them to have many, if not all of those benefits that we talked about of having a registration and being in the database. If a brand is a cannabis brand or service that is directly impacted by the CSA, they are still able to register with the USPTO for goods or services that don't invoke the CSA. So like that Chong's Choice example that I just provided, or like the example that I provided of, of dividing up your products and services to those you can register and those you can't, in this case, if there are no CBD products that could be registered. The option would be to register something like apparel or something like a website or blog that uses the brand name. It's not going to have quite the same scope of protection. It doesn't come as close to touching the core of the brand's business, but it does at least provide some protection. It does at least allow them to be registered and to appear in the database and allow the owner to use the circle R in certain circumstances. And so there still is a tremendous value, again, if that's the only option, it's better than nothing. So many such brands can and do and should seek USPTO registration for goods or services that are not affected by the CSA. Again, apparel or providing a website with information or other products. So you see MedMen, has a variety of registrations, one of which is for plastic water bottles, one of which is for a blog featuring information about the social and medical benefits of cannabis. Providing information, providing a website doesn't violate the CSA, so many businesses are eligible to receive registration for that service. Caviar Gold, you see the, the logo and the shirt um, image on the side here, is registered for t-shirts. They registered for t-shirts, presumably because that's all they could get registered. That's better than nothing. Does it protect them fully in a dispute related to their core products? Um, not 100%, and there really aren't a lot of cases yet that deal with such disputes, but it is 
clearly valuable in some manner. It's better than nothing. Again, it gives them a tool, a weapon to deal with potential situations. Why would you register with the USPTO if the core products are affected by the CSA and cannot be covered? Again, something is going to be better than nothing. And again, if you don't register with the USPTO, your rights may be limited to um, the geographic area where you're operating. And then you would have no rights in other states or other locations where you're not operating or doing any business. So there's a tremendous value to having some federal rights for some products or services. Again, tremendous value to appear in the USPTO database as brands prepare to create new names and search the USPTO, as brands and their attorneys prepare to clear new names, prepare to file new applications to see what's already out there, one of the primary places they're looking is in the USPTO database. If you're in the USPTO database in some manner, at least you have a chance of getting picked up and potentially blocking a situation before you ever know about it. And also, once you're in the USPTO database, again, the USPTO is doing some of the work for you by reviewing a future applications for possible conflicts with marks that are already in the database. So they're doing work for you and they refuse applications all the time based on confusion with previously registered marks. The registrants don't even necessarily ever know or find out that their registration was the basis of someone getting denied. The USPTO is doing the work for you, in essence, doing it for free for you. Before I turn to state um, registrations, um, you know, there's been some discussion about how the USPTO has been handling applications in the last few months before this current policy doctrine was um, put forth last week. And to some extent now, how they were handling it maybe doesn't matter, um, but they, are, they were then and they are still sending these applications to a specific group of attorneys who work for the USPTO, examining attorneys or examiners, who have been trained on these issues and are um, essentially only reviewing these applications since there's been such a high volume. So the good news is that they're being trained, they're aiming for as much consistency as possible in how they're being handled. The, the bad news is that it has led to some significant delays in these applications over the last year or so. But I was at a conference with the uh, Commissioner for Trademarks just a few weeks ago, right before this policy guidance was announced, and she indicated that they have trained and added more attorneys to this unit um, handling these applications in just the last few weeks. And so we should see the delay times start to come down. And there is some strategy in how applications are filed in terms of what might trigger an analysis by the USPTO that would raise these issues, raise these concerns, direct them to these examiners. Um, as long as the information in the application is accurate and complete, um, there may be strategies to try to obtain protection without um, without directing or acknowledging outwardly the fact that the business is also involved in um, these industries or in uh, services or products that may invoke the CSA and try to avoid this um, extra layer of review by the USPTO. But the USPTO is likely to look at the descriptions of goods and services. They're going to look at the evidence of use that's been filed, and they're quite likely to look at an applicant's website much of the time for additional information and background. So um, 
A, it's not really um, a strategy to try to avoid that, but it is something that, you know, all other things being equal, it would be great to avoid even the inquiry as to whether the CSA and these things um, apply. But again, the most important thing in dealing with the USPTO and the application is to make sure that everything is accurate and thorough and complete and that there are no misleading or false statements being made because that could um, jeopardize the application or even jeopardize a registration that's been issued and um, will create create more harm than it would have uh, created benefit. So um, state registrations for many years, you know, for the last, for I said I've been doing this for 19, almost 20 years. For about 18 of those years, I, I, I um, advised clients to file state registrations on like less than the number of fingers that I'm holding up. It occurred very, very infrequently where there would be a significant benefit in filing for a state trademark registration. But in the last few years, with um, the explosion of these industries and with the limited federal options or no federal options for some businesses who operate entirely in an area that's affected by the CSA, um, state registration is a good choice for them and it is a viable option and it is better, certainly better than nothing. And it depends on the state. Um, we're seeing more and more states now catch up and realize that if they've legalized um, either medical or recreational or both cannabis use and businesses and that they ought to provide a mechanism for those businesses to protect their brands in the state. And so California, Colorado, and Washington now specifically allow for their trademark registry, registries to handle descriptions that involve goods or services related to cannabis. Some of the other states do not. And so you have to sort of check state by state. And it's important when you're dealing with state issues that you generally have to deal with an attorney who is licensed to practice in your particular state, particular state and can provide specific guidance on those state registrations. But when you get a federal registration, generally you're not so concerned about also getting a state registration because the federal registration covers all 50 states. But as I said, there could be circumstances where all of these tools are useful for some businesses. So if a business has products that um, are CBD and products that are cannabis based and they could get USPTO registration for the CBD products under the new policy, they um, would be wise to consider getting state registration in the states where they operate for the cannabis or other products that they can't include in the description at the USPTO. So they're kind of covering all of the angles, all of the bases to get the maximum extent of protection that they're allowed to at this time. And if they're operating in more than one state, then they may need multiple state registrations. And there are, the state registration process is generally quicker, cheaper, and simpler than the federal registration process. The federal registration process on average takes about a year from start to finish. And again, that may take longer now for brands that are falling under this new policy or invoking this new policy um, because of the delays and the backlog and the specifics um, that the USPTO is going to go through to make sure there's compliance with the policy. Um, but the important thing is the filing date, because the filing date is when you get in the public records and when your place in line starts and when you start getting a lot of the protections. Um, so that process, again, takes a while at the federal level. At the state level, it generally is like you submit the form and you receive the registration a few weeks later at the most, because they don't do the same kind of um, thorough re review, and they don't necessarily, they don't have the same number of applicants coming in and the same process um, that they're going through. But there are different requirements in states. For, for example, most of the states do, uh, in fact, I'm not aware of any states that allow you to file based on 
intent to use as the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office does federally. For the state registrations, you generally have to show that you're properly licensed and that you are already making sales in that state. So there are now more options than ever, as we've discussed, both federally and on a state basis. And it's now more important than ever because the industry is growing so rapidly, because the number of brands is growing so rapidly, because I know you've seen the same number, the same words and terms coming up in so many brand names all the time, because people are trying to communicate what industry they're in many, much of the time. And so um, that is causing, you know, a, a cluster problem for um, these common terms or common designs and logo themes as well. And so it is more important than ever that brands proactively get out there and do what they can under these parameters to try to obtain the maximum coverage for their brands that they can. It's possible, of course, that a business has multiple trademarks that need to be filed and they may not all follow the same strategy. They may have different products that they're used with um, or different strategies for other reasons. There um, can be a multitude of brand names under one business umbrella. There can be different logos. There can be slogans. There are times when product packaging or even product shapes and configurations to the extent that they're unique and distinctive in an industry can be registered and protected um, at the federal level and in some cases on the state level. These are generally called um, trade dress or non-traditional trademarks. That's something we're seeing some growth in in this industry as well. Another reason that it's more important than ever for brands in the industry to consider where they fit in finding their maximum protection is the geographic issues. The fact that a business may only be operating in a particular state and therefore there's nothing inherently stopping a business in another state from operating under the same or very similar brand name because they're under two different regulatory schemes and because they're not directly um, marketing to the same consumers or at least the same geographic area. And this creates a lot of special and uh, difficult and complex trademark dispute issues. We're just seeing them start to arise. I believe there will clearly be many more of them in the future. One example is litigation ongoing now about Harvest brand names between, um, I, I think it's actually Arizona. I, I think I made a mistake on the slide, but Arizona or Nevada, Harvest and dispensary with several locations in San Francisco using a Harvest brand name. And again, there are some limitations geographically to rights unless there are federal filings. And in this case, there are some federal filings. And so it's an overlap of federal and state issues. But of course, then we have the additional complexity added in here that the federal courts or federal rights are going to be limited to products or services that don't involve the CSA. So may there still be some federal rights, again, federal registration for other products or for a website or for apparel, and how does that play into these disputes? There are no simple answers. The only, um, the best advice I can give is, of course, the more protection and the more proactive you are with the protection, the better off you're likely to be in avoiding such a situation and dealing with such a situation. I'm again seeing several questions pop up here that I don't have, I, I can't read them all in detail and answer them individually here. Um, but these issues with one thing in one state and another thing in another state and how does that interplay and overlap. And there are no simple, clear answers to that yet. Um, but we're going to be 
helping to answer and provide some more guidance on those again in the summary that we send out in the next day or two. So we um, went through the materials here and um, I want to thank everybody for participating and for logging in and for what I've seen all of the great questions. Um, I will again be looking at the questions and be um, pointing out some responses and some tips and some key takeaways in the summary that we're going to send out that will include a link to the full download of this presentation so you can um, catch any part you missed or go back over any detail. And in that, we'll also have some links to some key resources like the USPTO's policy guide, um, and the USPTO website. Uh, and I want to thank you all for participating. You see here on the last slide, um, if you have particular questions and you want to discuss what the next steps are for your brand or how this applies to your business and your brand, um, please send me an email or Barina an email. You see our emails here. I will include those again in the follow-up. Um, that we're sending out and we look forward to speaking with some of you and um, working to ensure that your trademarks are protected uh, to the maximum extent possible.